Uh, the Global Campus of Human Rights is a network of almost 100 uh, universities around the world uh, dedicated to education, research and uh, training on human rights and democratization. The webinar is part of one of our online activities. Uh, we have many, uh, but this is part of a recently launched MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, precisely dedicated to the UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty. The course offers the possibility to really get some insights into the process of the Global Study and to learn directly from the experts who participated in the research, in the making of this Global Study. And today you have the opportunity to hear directly from the lead expert of this global study. In fact, I have the pleasure to be here with Professor Manfred Novak, who was appointed by the UN uh, General Assembly to conduct this uh, UN global study. So, Manfred, thank you very much for being here. Thanks very much for inviting me and I'm very happy to answer whatever questions or comments you might have. Uh, in, in respect to the whole issue of children deprived of liberty. Yes, and indeed we do have a, a good number of questions from our participants and I want to take this opportunity to also thank all of you who submitted the questions and also those of you who are watching us either now live or later on because the webinar is being recorded so you will have the opportunity to watch it again also later. So before starting with the questions, maybe I think it would be interesting for the viewers, uh, for, uh, for them to hear from you something about the results of the study. What are the key issues and the key messages of the study? Perhaps I <coughs> first should show what the global study is. And it is a quite heavy piece of book. It's about 800 pages and uh, we just managed all together, it's a big joint effort to finalize this study um, before, just when we arrived in Geneva on the 18th um, of November, the same day when this MOOC was launched. Um, and we went to a press conference and just there I got this book into my hands. Um, and um, yeah, we are very proud that we managed uh, to really collect so many data and that's the main aim that we know better how many children are actually deprived of liberty. So according to our <coughs> uh, data collection, research and whatever we did, uh, we are estimating that there are more than 7 million children currently worldwide deprived of liberty <coughs> in different settings. Most of them, 5.4 million, are in institutions where the children that are not behaving well are there for educational supervision, etc. Um, this number is already less than the 8 million children that were estimated about 10 years ago in institutions. So it shows that there is a certain process of the institutionalization. Uh, Secondly, the administration of justice. We have about 410,000 children in pre-trial detention and in um, post-trial detention and imprisonment. And that is again less than about 1 million children UNICEF always estimated. Um, but of course we have to also add about 1 million children uh, per year in police custody. So again together it's about 1.4 million. Then there's a third category of migration-related detention, and that's about 330,000 children. Again, all these are very conservative estimates. Then we have about 35,000 children that are detained in the context of armed conflict. Uh, most of them, 29,000 children currently, are those that were related to the Islamic State and are now detained in makeshift camps by the Kurdish authorities in the north of Syria or in Iraq. Um, and they don't really know what to do with them uh, because often European states where they are coming from don't want to take them back. Then we have a small number of about 1,500 children that are detained for national security grounds. That means primarily terrorism-related charges, whether it's in the US, 
in Europe or in, in, in other countries. And finally, about 19,000 children that are growing up with their mothers uh, who are imprisoned uh, for the first years when they are infants. So that altogether makes about 7.2 million uh, children. Um, and of course, the conditions in all these institutions are usually very bad, overcrowded, no access to education, no access to proper health care, uh, no privacy, etc. So our main recommendation is, on the one hand, deinstitutionalize. I think we don't need these old-fashioned big institutions, and they should be replaced by non-custodial small groups where children can live without being deprived of liberty, uh, primarily, of course, in the family or in foster families, in the extended family, and not putting them, in particular children with disabilities, not putting them in segregated institutions. Secondly, in the criminal justice, establish special child justice systems with special courts, special police officers trained how to treat children, and then apply diversion methods at every stage. The police already, uh, if um, a girl or a boy have committed a crime, yeah, could actually bring them into the justice system or say, okay, it's not such a serious crime. Uh, I think if, if, we, if we catch you a second time, then, but now go home. Um, can also be with uh, the prosecutor. So the police brings them to the prosecutor, but then the prosecutor says, is it really necessary to charge them to start a formal judicial, criminal judicial proceeding? Uh, again, we give you a warning, uh, or we find an alternative way how we deal with you. Um, and the third one are the judges. Even if there is a trial, finally the judge can still decide. Uh, I think there are also fines or other forms of traditional or, or restorative justice, it doesn't always have to be imprisonment. Um, so, and in migration-related detention, there we are very clear that the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which says that deprivation of liberty of children should only be a measure of last resort, and only for the really shortest appropriate period of time, that my purely migration-related detention can never be a measure of last resort, never be in the best interest of the child, because there are always non-custodial solutions uh, available. Um, so that's why these 330,000 children actually are kept in migration detention in violation of international law. So these are, in a nutshell, the most important uh, conclusions, findings, and recommendations uh, that you find here, much more detailed with many statistics, infographs, photos, etc. Um, in this book, which is the first printed version. It's also online already available and the more interactive online version will be published on the 10th of December, the Human Rights Day. But we will also produce a more child-friendly version uh, later. So there are various ways and means how you can actually read and uh, and see what our main findings are. Thank you, Manfred. And all the participants in the MOOC have the book available online in our platform. I want to take this also uh, um, link to what you just said about the uh, friendly version for children and uh, the different versions of the uh, study. There is a question from one of our participants, Maud, who asks, she says, if I'm not mistaken, I heard there were plans to publish the study in accessible versions. So uh, do you have still these plans? Can you say something about this? Yes. I mean, first of all, we really did our best. And if you look into here, uh, it is not written in a difficult way. I mean, the health chapter is more difficult, but that's more for health professionals. But uh, it is reader-friendly, because you, wherever possible, we have uh, included pictures, uh, tables, infographs, etc. Um, and also the different colors show that you find your way quite, uh, quite easily within the study. Um, but of course, um, it is a scientific study. It is involved more than 100 researchers 
from different institutions, in particular also from the Global Campus of Human Rights. Um, so we will make a child-friendly version um, that will be also much shorter, so really focusing on the main conclusions and recommendations. And the study is also addressed to children, not only to states and UN agencies, etc. Children played a very important role in the preparation of the study. For instance, we interviewed 274 children in 22 separate countries uh, to give us their views, their perceptions, their experiences. What did you experience in different types of deprivation of institutions of deprivation of liberty? So it's also not only a study on children, it's also a study for children. And I really want to encourage children uh, to take their own initiatives. For instance, if children are deprived of liberty, they have the right to complain. Make use of this right to complain because you have a right to participate in every decision that directly affects you. Um, and in reality, children are almost never asked uh, when they are or whether they should be separated from their parents because the parents might perhaps be a little bit violent, whatever. Um, it's still the children should be heard and their voices should be reflected in the decision by judges, administrative authorities, but also by their parents. Sure. And this is one of the uh, part child participation is one of the cross cutting themes that are included in, in, the, in the study, together with what you already mentioned about health and also gender, the gender dimension of the privation of liberty for children and the um, situation of children with disabilities exactly. who are deprived of liberty. And this is precisely what we are studying this week in, in, in the MOOC. So it's good that we make connection about all these aspects. Now, going to some of the questions of, the, of our participants, I want to start with one that covers one of the areas that you mm -hmm. mentioned, that is uh, children uh, being deprived of liberty together with their family members, or uh, most often with their mothers. So this is a question that Millie asked, and she says, I'm thinking of a situation where a lactating mother is imprisoned and automatically the child is detained too with the mother. Yes, it's depriving the child of its liberty, but at the same time, taking the child away into foster would be in a way depriving the child of the normal comfort, let alone motherly love, nutrition, etc. What's your take on such scenario, Professor Novak? Mili, I think you already addressed the main dilemma that we are facing here. Of course, it's not ideal if children grow up in a prison Prison environments are never nice environments. Um, so if there is, if your mother, uh, sometimes also your father, but we only found that in Finland, in all the other countries it's in fact mothers that have to some extent the right to keep their infants um, up to a certain age uh, in prison when they are incarcerated. Um, and of course, if there are alternatives, if there is a father that really can take care of the child or grandparents or the extended family, um, then one should really think about what is better for the child and very often they can take care as well as the mother who actually did commit a crime uh, before she was incarcerated. On the other hand, if there is no such alternative, and the alternative would only be to actually put the child in an orphanage or this kind of institutions, then I feel that it is better if they stay with their mothers. Of course, the best would be if mothers with small children would not at all be sentenced to a prison sentence. Uh, there are always alternative house arrest. You can have some kind of electronic shackles, etc. But um, if there's no other alternative, then, um, and in particular, if she is breastfeeding, that is the time when the child is really developing a very, very intensive bond with the mother and the mother with the child. So, and for, and I have visited many prisons around the world, um, where I also found in many female prisons uh, small children. 
And it sounds a bit strange, but as soon as you see children running around in a prison, it's much more humane. You cannot actually lock up a child in a small cell because children are children. They want to run around, they, but they are usually have a good mood. They, um, it's also that the other mothers then uh, feel that they want to play with the children and take care of them. So it's a much more open environment, an open prison. For children, you also need minimum hygienic needs. So uh, it's more cleaner usually than other prisons. So there are many positive sides. I still don't say it's in the best interest of the child to grow up in the prison, but um, I found in these cases, if there's no alternative, I think uh, we should give them an opportunity uh, to stay together, but then we should also try that they are released together. So if the mother is in prison for five years and the state has a very strict requirement, no longer than three years, then the authorities should be much more flexible. So that's, a, that's another recommendation, because if you have been three years together with your child, then the bond is already very, very strong. And if you're then separating them, it, you might create perhaps more damage than if you take the, the little child after birth away and put her into a foster care, etc. It's, it's a complex issue, but um, uh, thank you for your insights on this. You mentioned that you visited a lot of prisons. Um, I maybe should mention that uh, Manfred was also a UN Special Rapporteur on Torture between 2004-2010, if I'm not wrong. Right. So that was also a time when you, uh, in a way, uh, witnessed so, so much suffering and uh, could also bring some of that expertise into this uh, UN uh, global study. So now I want to relate to another question that deals with something that's related to, to torture in a sense and to um, uh, this other area because this is another uh, area of the, that the study focuses on. So this is a question from Francesca. Uh, uh, who wants to ask a question regarding those cases where children are deprived of liberty and tortured because of national security issues. So do you believe these violations of their human rights and of international law can amount to crimes against humanity? Uh, Francesca, thanks. It's a very good question. Um, of course, as you know yourself, crimes against humanity are defined in the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, as certain crimes, and torture is one of them, extrajudicial killings, etc., but only if they are committed in the context of a systematic or widespread practice. Um, I would think, for instance, uh, if the Islamic State or Boko Haram as uh, terrorist groups or extremist groups, uh, and they are recruiting children in a systematic manner and then very often torturing them or uh, really uh, exploiting them. There's a lot of sexual violence uh, against girls uh, and uh, many of those children have been forced to really carry out very brutal acts including uh, decapitation so, uh, it's, it's, uh, or, or having at least to, to watch very brutal uh, ways of killing people. Uh, that amounts to torture. Uh, it's at least uh, both physical and mental torture. And if it is done in a systematic practice, then it's definitely a crime against humanity. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to something more general now so that we balance a bit the sp very specific questions and uh, more general questions related to the, the study. So this comes from Muna. Uh, Muna is from Liberia and uh, he has two questions actually. One is how can we stop violence against children around the world? And the second one is how can we improve the lives of those children living in various orphanages and those uh, loitering the street? That's a bold question. Um, as you know, uh, Muda, that uh, the Paulo Sergio Pinheiro has written a very comprehensive study on violence against children uh, in 2006, and that covers violence in the family, in schools, on the street, in institutions, etc. 
Um, and uh, this study already had a major impact. Um, we are no longer accepting corporal punishment against children. There are many states that have enacted laws that not only prohibit corporal punishment in schools or in the justice system or in institutions, but also any form of mental, physical, sexual, verbal violence in the family. So very often even parents can already be punished. Um, and that had a major impact. So I would, I would think we are there on the, on the right way in, um, in, in really creating this awareness that, uh, and, and I mean, think back 20, 30 years, whether it's here in Europe or in other parts of the world, um, it was seen as a normal way of education. So if your child doesn't behave well, yeah, you can hit it. Uh, I think we are slowly going away from this mindset, from this attitude. And that's, but I think much more needs to be done in terms of awareness raising, but finally also applying uh, criminal law if there's no other alternative in order to punish the perpetrators so that they are no longer, um, and, and perhaps also taking away. I mean, if children always, sorry, if parents always beat up their children or sexually misuse them, the state has an obligation to uh, either interfere by educating the parents or putting a lot of pressure on the parents not to do it and if that doesn't help to take away the children and put them to foster parents or, or to grandparents etc. Um, the other question was... It on, was more about on, uh, how, how can we improve the lives of children living in orphanages? Abolish orphanages. I think that's... Uh, so our main recommendation is deinstitutionalization. Um, many orphanages simply uh, are not needed. Um, about 80% of the children worldwide in orphanages still have at least one parent. So if you support the families financially, with education, with all kinds of assistance, then the parents are in a much better position uh, to take care of their children rather than putting them in orphanages because they feel both, uh, yeah, both parents have to work and they're very poor and uh, nobody supports them and then they feel it's the easiest to put the child in an orphanage. Um, secondly, um, even if the both parents are dead, there are other non-custodial solutions. You can support foster families. Uh, and uh, so we, what we say, every child has the right to grow up in a family or in a family type setting. That might be a small group where six, seven children live together uh, with people who are not simply employees of a big institution or orphanage, but who have this kind of quasi uh, mother or father role uh, so that you also can bond. The, the, the main thing is children have a right to grow up in a loving environment. Uh, some of the children whom we interviewed told me, what's the major difference between an institution and a family? Even the family might be, many families are not very nice and beat their children or so, but still it's their children. And in the evening they bring you to bed they might give you a kiss, they might uh, read a, a story so that you can better sleep away and you feel protected by your parents because you have a bond to your parents. In an institution it's nine o'clock, everybody goes to bed and if you don't go to bed there is a punishment, etc. There is no kiss, there is no love, there is no bonding because these are employees and the next evening there are other employees there and that is together with the strict discipline, uh, that is what makes institutions so inhuman. Yes, and I think it, it connects also with the, one of the key messages of the global study is that depriving children of liberty is depriving them of their childhood, right? Yes. 
So uh, going uh, now to another more specific question. This comes from Angel, uh, who is a counselor and teacher in the Philippines. And he asks, how can we strike a balance in terms of the criminal age, especially committing crimes, even universal or absolute definition of the term liberty? First, the criminal age. So um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the main body that is monitoring compliance with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, has clearly said uh, the minimum age of criminal responsibility should not be below 14 years old. Uh, and I think that's very important. If 10-year-old kids uh, do something wrong, there's always the, the parents, first of all, in the child welfare system that should deal with them, but not courts and criminal justice systems. So the fact that the Philippines, under President Duterte, were recently lowering even the minimum age of criminal responsibility is a matter of major concern, and I have also already exactly at that time immediately spoken out uh, and appealed to President Duterte not to do that, and I think uh, finally, there was a kind of a compromise um, reached. So uh, it is important if smaller kids do something wrong, the child welfare system, it's, if it is well resourced and also well educated, uh, can deal with them <coughs> in every country of the world. Um, the term liberty <coughs> has different meanings. On the one hand, of course, liberty is the same like freedom. I have the freedom of expression. I have the freedom to travel around the world. I have the, uh, the freedom of demonstrating, uh, the freedom of uh, founding an association, uh, etc. And many people say freedom simply means as long as I'm not interfere in the freedom with others, I can do whatever I want. And it's very important also in a liberal society that you enjoy all those different freedoms. Um, the right to personal liberty is much more narrow. So it means if I lock somebody in a room, a cage, but also it can be a house, a prison, an institution, where this person cannot leave at his or her free will, then you are deprived of liberty. If I put you on an island, and say you are not allowed to leave the island. It depends how big the island is. And uh, so uh, then we are speaking about interference with freedom of movement. And that's, of course, a, a slippery slope where you, where you draw the line. So if you, for instance, are not allowed to leave the city of Venice, then you are not deprived of liberty, but of course you are deprived of uh, your freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have another general question. This is from uh, Thomas, uh, who lives in Zambia. And he says, understanding that one of the contributing factors to the deprivation of liberty among children is poverty, has the study included a mechanism that will help mitigate the high levels of poverty, especially in third world countries like mine? Of course, Thomas, poverty is an aggravating factor. If countries are very poor, usually the prison conditions are very poor, there's not enough food, not enough health care, uh, etc. But I would warn to think that poverty is the main reason why children are deprived of liberty. I give you an example. The highest number uh, of children deprived of liberty in the administration of justice is in the United States of America, which is not particularly a very poor country. There's a lot of poverty, of course, in the United mm -hmm. States, and most of them who are deprived of liberty come from the uh, Afri African, Asian, or Latin American, uh, the African American or Latin American uh, community. Uh, but still, it's not the reason is not poverty. The reason number so. Um, I think uh, it is, there are other reasons than poverty that bring children into a situation where they are deprived of liberty. And then, of course, in poorer countries, the situation is uh, not as good as in rich countries. But even that is not always, I mean, I felt in the poorest countries in Africa, for me, the prisons were more humane than in richer countries like China, 
or, or the United States of America. So uh, even there I would say it's the, the mindset, it's the, the attitude to crime, the attitude to migration. That is the major reason why children are deprived of liberty, not poverty. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now there is a question from Yelena uh, about inclusion and institutions. We said that one of the cross-cutting themes that's been analyzed in the study is that of disability. Uh, so Yelena asks how to include children with special educational needs and disabilities in schools and educational institutions if the child is not able to tolerate such environment. Is it then justified to move the child into institutions? Jelena, again, this is a very, very difficult question. In principle, and the disability movement worldwide makes that very, very clear, and the Disability Convention of the United Nations says no person, whether child or adult, shall solely on the reason that he or she has a disability be deprived of liberty. So the, the main philosophy is inclusion. And that starts already with uh, very, very small children uh, who have a mental or a physical disability. In the old days, there was a lot of either public decisions, for instance, in the, in the old communist systems in, in, in Europe and, and Central Asia, where they have said, okay, children with disabilities should be immediately separated from the parents. The state takes care of them and they were ending up in the most terrible and inhuman forms of institutions. So what we are saying is uh, a child with a, an impairment uh, might need special assistance. And parents are often not in the situation to provide it. They have to work, they, they, are, they might be poor, etc. So that means that the state has an obligation to provide the family with the assistance in order so that they themselves can take care of their children. Um, so that's important. Secondly, you might also have a serious impairment where you need personal assistance. Again, it's a question of how rich or poor a country is, but in principle, that is what we want. So don't segregate children with mental or physical disabilities in schools, in special schools, uh, try to keep them in the ordinary schools. What the, what the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says is, uh, it's a very, very uh, simple principle, uh, the impairment itself is not the major problem, because there are technically and other means that people can deal with their impairment. The problem is the attitude of the society. We have all kinds of barriers, mental barriers, physical barriers, so that people with a wheelchair cannot access uh, the public transport or theaters, etc. Um, and that's why they are then put into segregated schools or other institutions. So as far as possible, I'm not saying there might not be very, very special cases where uh, the, where parents simply are not able to deal with those children, but these are very, very little. And then you might have, again from the child welfare system, you might have somebody who assists you, who comes perhaps every second day, uh, in order to show you how do, how do you deal best with this child with a disability. And then you will see, and many parents afterwards say, it was the most beautiful time to take care of a child with a disability because they have so special needs. But on the other hand, they have, they are again, like all the other children, their most important need is to be loved. And you can be loved only in principle by your own parents. Yes, and I think it's a matter of the state and those responsible to shift a bit the paradigm and see the human rights based model uh, approach to disability where a person with disability is not an object of charity or an object of welfare but is a subject of rights. So an there object are, of medical care. Not the yes, old model was the old model, yes. Persons with disabilities 
should go into hospitals because they need to be treated. No. If you have a mental illness or a physical illness, yes, then you can be treated. With a disability, there is nothing to be treated. It, you should not be seen as a medical case. Mm, yes, and as you said, it's not the, the impairment itself that's the problem in a, yeah. in a way. Um, we have talked a lot about the state and what state should do, so the role of the major uh, mm -hmm. duty bearer, in a sense, in the language that we use. Uh, there is a question here from Edith, uh, from Cameroon. She works on the, in the area of child abuse in all forms, and she deals a lot with policies on child protection. And she has uh, two questions related to, in a sense, the um, compliance uh, of states uh, uh, with human rights standards. So she asks, how can international bodies, external agencies, use their influence to ensure that such initiatives, such policies, are not just inscribed in the nation's policy, but are actively implemented to produce tangible results that would build a strong nation with a functional and healthy children. So a matter of implementation, in a sense. And then the second question is, what mechanisms are put in place for follow-up and supervision to ensure that these policies are implemented, implemented to the letter? I mean, that's of course a little bit the weak point of the United Nations. Uh, again, also now suffering from uh, less funds, etc. But UNICEF is a, a richer, UN agency. It's an organization that has offices in most countries of the world and it is precisely the task of UNICEF, the UN Children Fund, uh, to assist states in implementing, for instance, decisions of the Committee on the Rights of the Child or implementing now the recommendations of the Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty. Um, and UNICEF does a lot. It was originally a charitable organization, uh, but with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it totally changed and it became a human rights organization. Uh, so they look at the human rights implications and are assisting. Of course, you have the monitoring by the Committee on the Rights of the Child. All states have to submit certain reports where they say what they have done in order to implement the convention. And then there is a constructive dialogue. The committee tells them there and there there's a problem. Non-governmental organizations also say, but here you have forgotten that's a particular problem you should address. And also the state reporting procedure has a certain impact uh, in, in improving the situation. And now children might even bring their own complaints to the human rights, uh, to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And we had very recently a very important uh, decision uh, that the committee said actually that the practice of Spanish pushbacks of migrant children. There was a, a guy from Mali, about 14 years old, who wanted, who were traveling to Morocco and then he wanted to come to the European Union. And you know there are these big fences in the Ceuta and Melilla in the north of Africa. So he finally managed to cross these uh, fences uh, and the Spanish authority immediately sent them back to the Moroccans. Um, and the committee said no, that is as soon as he is on Spanish territory, he is a minor, he is 14 year old, you have an obligation to actually bring them to the Spanish welfare authorities in order to deal with them, to see whether he wants to apply for asylum, etc. So, and uh, now we are working on how to implement that. And that means speaking to the Spanish government, but also to other governments in Europe who do exactly the same. So, there is, uh, I mean, international monitoring bodies might not be the, the most effective ones in terms of financial resources, etc., and their mandate, but uh, they also have an impact. Yes, indeed. Um, since we are mentioning some countries in particular, I have a question here from Abir. Uh, he's asking, per international laws, what is the legality of the Israeli juvenile military courts and judges trialing Palestinian minors between the ages of 12 to 15? 
as you are in, in a professor in international law. Of course. I mean, uh, I think there's no country in the world where the United Nations, uh, whether it's the International Court of Justice, whether it's the Human Rights Committee, whether it's the Human Rights Council, the major political body, and many others, the Security Council, have taken decisions uh, and strongly criticized, first of all, the general policy of Israel to occupy the Palestinian territories uh, and this whole settlement policy, etc. And one is really that Palestinian children, boys in particular, who throw stones at, uh, at the, the Israeli military are then picked up uh, and these are minor, I mean, it's, uh, it's understandable that they, they are not happy with this form of occupation. Um, and I mean, that is not a reason to actually detain them and bring them before a military court. So that is certainly non-proportional to the, the little uh, misdemeanor that they, they have done. Uh, and in particular, we have quite a high number of these Palestinian children who are deprived of liberty for quite a long time by the Israeli police and military. And that's again, uh, for, for those reasons, totally unproportional. It's certainly not a measure of last resort as the Convention on the Rights of the Child is requiring. So that means it violates the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Thank you, Manfred. As our time is coming to, towards the end, I want to finish with uh, just a couple of questions mm -hmm. and maybe one comment. So uh, this question comes from Ghana, uh, from Rukia. Uh, and I, I would like to read it because it's a sort of like uh, an interesting approach. Uh, so he's saying, Sir, do, due to the high level of poverty in rural villages in Ghana, especially in the northern region and Volta region, a lot of children are being forced into early child marriage and child labor. Children are forced to be adult. How can we ensure that these children are not deprived of their liberty as children? Uh, that is a, a little bit a different uh, question. Um, it does not really fall under the mandate of, the, of, of this study on children deprived of liberty, although it is very, a very phenomenon that is very closely related. So uh, early child marriages are prohibited under international law. Uh, there is a convention on the minimum age of uh, marriage and uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child is saying it should uh, definitely be raised and uh, in many Islamic countries where you have uh, seven-year-old girls that are married to adult men, etc. That certainly not, it should not be a forced marriage and not an early child marriage. Um, so that is, uh, that is certainly prohibited under international mm -hmm. law. And uh, the other one is child was labor. child labor. That is more difficult. We had an old convention on child labor that more or less outlawed any form of child labor. Um, and that was simply not practical. That's why we have now an ILO convention, 183, on the worst forms of child labor. And that is really exploitation of children in uh, mines uh, for prostitution and hard work, etc. And that is absolutely prohibited. So we have to draw the line there. Um, and of course, it's often a question of poverty. And in many <coughs> poor countries, the parents um, feel that they have no other alternative uh, than to ask the child, instead of going to the school, uh, to do some light work. Um, and uh, again, that is certainly not what should be, because children have not only a right, they have also an obligation, at least to the age of 14, 15, to go to school and should not work. Uh, but if they do some light work with their parents in the in the, if they are peasants, etc., after school, that is certainly not a violation of international law. Uh, but uh, these worst forms of child labor need to be eradicated. That is very, very important. 
Thank you. Thank you, Manfred, for answering questions <coughs> that might have uh, uh, been a bit aside from the, the actual focus of, of the study. But in, in a way, I think the, the, the participant was concerned about the deprivation of childhood, as, as this is one of the key messages anyway of the global study. I wanted maybe to conclude with a comment uh, that I particularly uh, appreciated and maybe see also what you think. Um, this is from Chileshe, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Um, she is from Zambia and she says, with children uh, who are in prisons or uh, detention centers, it is possible to speak out for them and try to ensure that they are not abused and once released that they are integrated <coughs> into society. However, since the deprivation of liberty does not always have bars and cages, it then becomes very difficult to speak for the children who uh, we do not even regard as having had their liberty taken away from them. Um, these children may be found in institutions, in homes, in orphanages, as we mentioned before, but might be kept worse than even in a prison cell. So she is hoping that this course will help uh, her to be able to identify these cases and how to go about ensuring that these children are not left behind so that we give voice to the voiceless, to those children that we don't, do not even imagine as being deprived of liberty because we usually think of deprivation of liberty as children behind bars. It's not only that, isn't it? Yes, I'm very grateful for this uh comment by you because that's one of my main messages uh, that we are not only dealing really with prisons, with prison walls, etc. We are, as I said at the beginning, the biggest amount of children deprived of liberty are in these institutions. And it's not always that clear to see are they really deprived of liberty. They are not, not big fences or walls. But very often, if they are actually then leaving and not coming home, let's say, at 8 or 9 in the evening, uh, then they are searching for them and the police brings them back. So that means that they are not, that they are deprived of liberty. They are not at their own free will that they can leave these institutions. And very often, whether you are placed in an institution by a court decision or whether simply your parents bring you in this institution because they feel they cannot deal anymore with you doesn't really make a difference. So that's why the biggest amount of children in institutions are what we call de facto deprived of liberty. There is no real decision of the state authority behind, but for the children it doesn't make a difference. They suffer as, uh, and uh, the level of violence in all forms of institution is, is unimaginable. Uh, it's on a daily <coughs> level that children are beaten up for minor infractions and uh, put in solitary confinement for uh, some kind of uh, wrongdoing. Um, and that is so, uh, I think, the, in quantitative terms, the most important recommendations is really deinstitutionalize. And there are many states in the world, I give you Bulgaria as one example, uh, where the government has decided and within the last 10-15 years reduced the number of children in institutions by more than 90%. So it is possible and they found non-custodial solutions for all those children. Uh, and that is what we should really promote in every state of the world so that uh, it's not only that we are, we are concerned about uh, the criminal justice system, we are even more concerned about children in institutions. Thank you, Manfred. I wanted to ask you some, to give us some good positive examples of good practices, and you just mentioned one, so you, you anticipated my last question. But maybe you have a final message that you would like to share with our viewers, with our course participants? I think the final message is, is certainly to children. Uh, so children should actually take much more active part in this whole discussion. We tried our best to have the voices of the children reflected in the study, uh, but uh, children as they go out on the Fridays for Future demonstrations and tell us adults what we have done wrong 
in not avoiding the climate crisis. And there are so many other areas where children have a right to be heard and taken seriously in all decisions and in all areas that directly affect them. Uh, and of course, whether you are taken away from your parents or your parents might divorce and then they decide what's the best for them and their children. No, we should look what is in the best interest of the child. Perhaps that the parents don't divorce or if they divorce that the two children go to the one, uh, one part to the mother or to the father but not being separated, etc. So, and so we need to take the voices of children much more seriously uh, and you should also know that you have a right to participate in every important decision and it also means you have the right to participate whether you should be deprived of liberty, whether you should be put in a, in a children's home or in another institution or not. You should be heard and you should protest against um, and uh, if you are treated in an inhuman manner in such an institution you have a right to complain and you should insist that you have this right to complain and if nothing else helps then complain, send a letter to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. So that is my certainly strongest message to children uh, are more active and more self-assured in defending your own rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manfred. It's been a pleasure talking to you, having this conversation. I'm sure that it's been appreciated by our uh, participants as well. And we wish you all the best for the future uh, steps. And we hope that the, the study will really be a, a game changer. Thank you also for all, uh, to all the viewers for being with us today. We look forward to continuing this conversation uh, in the course throughout the uh, weeks that uh, remain until the end of January. And let's hope to work together to bring about the change that we want to see for these children deprived of liberty. Thank you all. Thank you also. Thanks for your questions, comments and for your patience. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>